Over the coming weeks, I'll be releasing a few highlight videos from our first season of Open Source in Business. This episode is on the importance of trademark and branding for open source companies and open source projects. In our first episode, I spoke to Adam Jacob and Scott McCarty about how to resolve the tension between community brand, product brand, and company brand. And this is what Adam had to say. I think that's a great question. I think you, uh, first off, you if you're selling a product, you must own the brand, full stop, 100%, end of story. Mm -hmm. There is no conversation. There's no version of the universe where you sell a product, but you don't own the brand. That's insane, and it can't work. So, <laughs> um, so, so that's just, so we just start there. So like I'll use Chef as an example. I always own Chef. I, in, in the very beginning, I, Adam Jacob, owned the word, owned that software and owned its trademark and owned the thing. And then I started a company called Opscode. Then Opscode owned that trademark. And like, there was never a community version of Chef where that mark was in the world and didn't come with my largesse. Do you know what I mean? Like the world got it because I let them have it. <laughs> and, but it was never like we, there was a community around Chef and that community recognized chef as itself and i'm not saying it didn't have ownership over the experience or over that thing absolutely we did and it was thousands of people and it was one of the greatest things i've ever been a part of in my entire life it was beautiful it's still beautiful it's glorious um but uh but that brand belongs to chef it always belonged to chef um and the when we were an open core business we can we allowed that conflation to happen because we believed that it was a better it was better for conversion um, that that people believed that there was a that there was an open source distribution of chef that you could get for no money was was part of the conversion funnel to the paid versions of chef that I was trying to sell you sort of in the open core model when we shifted more to the free software product model more red hats model all of that went away but at one exception now there wasn't a version of chef anymore that was distributed free of my terms so in order to get chef you had to pay me for it at some point um whereas before i i would both make the software and i would give it to you for free right and now i make the software but i don't necessarily give it to you for free now there's another open source project that's called sync sync is downstream of chef stands for sync is not chef um and they produce their own builds they that you can go download sync right and they're a delightful group of people um, but that's the first time ever in the history of Chef's entire life that somebody who didn't work at Chef Inc. could make a build. And like, I just wanted like, like, which the delta there in its community management is just mind blowingly big, right? Um, and so, like, it's I would argue it's a much healthier thing now that there's that there are two because like there's actually a reasonable alternative now in a way that there never was before. Um, you were always sort of beholden to me. No, nobody likes it when you were getting something for free and now you can't. So like there were people who were mad because they were like, oh man, you used to like drop it off at my house and now you don't. And I'm like, well, yeah. Um, but but ultimately that's the, I think that that is the way you need to think about how you manage it because the the as a product owner, you must own the brand. If you don't, you don't have a product. Um, and And once you decide you're gonna own the brand, then the question is under what terms can people interact with it? It's a product, how can they buy it? Um, and, and it's usually better if it's separate, but I think you don't, it doesn't have to be separate, right? Um, what it has to be is yours. In the last episode of season one, Jason Kreidner of the BeagleBoard project also mentioned trademark as a good way to protect your brand when commercializing an open source product. I think there's a lot more interesting ways to try to protect your intellectual property and the things that, that you're doing differently than to try to, to hide the design uh, files, right? You know, it, it, that's that's probably not how most people are, are differentiating. Like intellectual property, of course, um, you've got copyright, you've got trademark, and you've got, you've got patents, and all that stuff is... Um, you know, may or may not be useful um, depending on where what you're trying to do because there's always going to be other people out there doing interesting things, but probably nobody doing exactly what you're trying to do. Um, and you know, I think that your brand matters a whole lot, um, and that that like for 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 BeagleBoard, it's all about our our trademark, right? That's that's the important, that's the valuable part. 
Um, you know, Adafruit produces a certain experience for people that go and, and shop on adafruit.com. And, you know, she doesn't just sell her products. She sells a lot of people's products, but they, they get an experience when they go to, you know, adafruit.com that um, they're going to be able to go and solve certain problems or go and, and you know, um, you know, achieve certain things, learn certain things, uh, build certain things. And I think that that's probably the more valuable thing to to protect than, than what the design files are. Yeah. When I spoke to John Lilly, former CEO of the Mozilla Corporation, I also asked him about the history of the Mozilla Firefox trademark and in particular about the Ice Weasel project that was launched by Debian at the time. I wanted to know whether the success of Firefox uh, depended on strong trademark protection as a consumer brand. How important was it for Firefox, the trademark, to be like have a pretty strong protection in terms of uh, its success? So, well, when you say um, almost everyone will remember the dispute you guys had with Debian and my audience, it's almost maybe maybe almost all of your friends will. <laughs> but like I, I kind of forgot about it. So um, it, it's a very nerd nerd specific topic. But the um, but what you notice right, which is open source has always been great about copyright law and always been really mute about what to do about trademarks. And it's because it's a different different form of law. Um, trademark was always for consumers. So it's like how do you how are you sure that when you go to the store and you buy a can of Coca Cola on the shelf, it's real Coca Cola. Um, and, uh, and so the, the government gives you the right to assert trademark to keep other people. So for consumer safety, basically consumer surety and Mitchell, um, you know, I don't know if people know this, but like Mitchell is a lawyer. So she understood this stuff from the, from the jump. And she understood that when people are going to be using this thing to get their internet and do their banking and their school and everything on, it had to be secure and people cons normal people not server operators not developers normal people had to have uh faith that it was really actual firefox um and so we were always strong trademark and we took a lot of heat from that in in the open source community so people said well we're not free software and the richard stallman um uh tradition or whatever which was true uh, we were asserting rights and we were saying, you can do this, you can't do this, which, you know, some people, some libertarians uh, don't love, and, but we felt like it was a it was requirement for consumers to be able to use, to, to, be, to be useful to consumers at all. And so that was, that was the right decision. Um, it made people mad. So it meant they couldn't use the logo or the, far, the trademark or whatever. Um, and we just had to take it. It was, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think there was any question that's the right thing to do. I think that it still probably makes people mad uh, today. I have to say, from a personal point of view, I've never seen any conflict between being free software and having strong trademark protections. I, I, like you said, I see them as orthogonal. So I don't think, personally, I don't think that affects the the, the freedom or not of the software. Yeah, yeah. I, I think different people have different views on this. And uh, I don't care what the term is. I just think as a practical matter, if if... I don't, if I'm not sure what Firefox is, then I don't really want to use it. Okay. In episode two of the first season, I spoke to Stephen O'Grady of Redmonk about how open source vendors can compete with hosted offerings in large public clouds. And Stephen once again brought up the value of, a, of building a brand and being the originator of a project as being valuable to customers. Well, I mean, I think there's a couple things. So first of all, um, typically, you know, for Amazon or for Google or for Microsoft or whomever, right, to offer uh, the project, that means they're seeing a ton of demand, right? Because they don't just pick up sort of tiny new projects that don't have any users. Um, there's, you know, that's just, there's nothing in it for them. So at the time when you begin competing with them, that means that you are a sort of widespread project. You have achieved a critical mass, right? So you are by definition sort of not really, I mean, you're the little guy relative to Amazon, you know, or whomever, of course, but you're not a little guy anymore. By definition, you're a, you're a sort of big entity in and of yourself. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to look at this, right? You know, sort of one way is that, um, and this is sort of one of the, the things that uh, we've seen a bunch of the commercial suppliers, typically on the database side, um, have, you know, sort of said, all right, we're going to release licenses, which essentially uh, behave in, in most respects like open source licenses, but, um, you know, it's explicitly and, and expressly forbid uh, players like the cloud players from using them. 
right? So that's one way to do it. You can basically say, all right, I'm going to, you know, essentially, you know, try to try to realize some of the benefits of open source, meaning that the source itself is available. Um, you know, people can sort of look at it, you know, potentially you contribute fixes and so on, although that becomes sort of fraught. Um, but you know, I just I don't want to compete with Amazon, right? I don't want Amazon or whomever to pick up my my stuff and run with it. So, so this is a, kind of a uh, commons clause or or uh, commons clause the newer licenses. Yep. Commons clause. I mean, you, you've seen a whole bunch of people have done this. Uh, Confluent, um, uh, Mongo, Timescale DB. You know, sort of list goes on and on and on, right? Um, and even sort of prior to them, Cockroach took this approach. Uh, Maria DB took this approach. So there's a whole bunch of people sort of have gone down this route. Um, in, you know, sort of intriguingly, most of them are database providers, but that's a whole, that's a much longer conversation. We probably don't have time for it here. Um, anyhow, the point is, is that, you know, this is essentially a, all right, I, I sort of want a firewall between, you know, sort of this project and, you know, any potential competition from Amazon or from ever. Um, so, you know, that is, that is an approach. It's an approach that, um, you know, look, if, if people do it right, as long as they don't blur the lines between the commercial license uh, and the open source license, then fine, right? You know, so be it. Um, if people are you know, sort of willing to be transparent and just say, hey, this is not open source, but, you know, it has some of the same attributes. Um, that's not a major concern, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, there are uh, the commons clause that you mentioned in particular. My issue with that was that, um, in my opinion, that that sort of intentionally and deliberately blurred the lines, right? So in other words, it was a, essentially a writer on an open source license that rendered the open source license uh, not open source effectively, right? So it was BSD plus, you know, commons clause or, you know, whatever it might be, Apache plus commons clause. And as soon as you attach that, the um, open source license mentioned up front is no longer relevant, right? Because the terms are not open source. So that was a, um, that that to me crossed a bright line in terms of hey we should have a clear delineation between what is and is not open source mm -hmm. um anyhow the, the sort of bigger question to me is you know of the people who are not in that camp right um of the people who have not taken that approach which is most vendors who are not in the database space um sort of why is that um and sort of what is the sort of thinking and the question to me is like if you are one of these providers thinking about taking that um, essentially exclusionary approach, you know, sort of question number one is, does it work, right? And the answer is probably not um, in the sense that, uh, you know, you take Mongo as an example, Mongo sort of um, transitioned from the AGPL, which is a very restrictive license, you know, from a, a cloud provider standpoint, introduced a new license, the SSPL. And uh, that license is not regarded as open source, um, not sanctioned by the OSI. Uh, and you know, so they did this, and what was it? Three months, I believe, afterwards, uh, Amazon came out with its Document DB service, which cloned um, the MongoDB API. And you know, a whole bunch of people said, "Well, hey, this is um, you know proof that this license protected uh, you know Mongo," when in fact, you know, the, that project development on the Amazon side had been underway for well over a year, right? So the license had nothing to do with. Um, you know, Amazon's sort of decision there. And more importantly, they're able to introduce a compatible service, you know, regardless of the source code, right? So essentially what Amazon is saying there is, is that the API is essentially what's valuable, not necessarily um, the source code implementation behind it. Um, so, you know, so that's point one. Point two is that uh, there are, you know, sort of recognizable and provable benefits for folks that do have, um, you know, sort of instantiation spun up by the cloud provider, right? On the one hand, you know, look, nobody in their right mind wants to compete with, you know, somebody like an Amazon or Google and, and so on, um, because they're large, they're well capitalized uh, and so on. But the flip side of that is, is that there are a ton of databases on the market, right, in any category that you pick. And one of the hyperscale providers coming along and saying, hey, I'm going to support this one, as we discussed previously, means that there are a lot of users of that, right? So in other words, let's say I'm in the market for a document database and I have a bunch of different options. And now I can pick between, you know, these ones that are smaller, don't see much usage, and one that is backed by um, both Mongo and Amazon and Microsoft, you know, with their Cosmos DB product, right? That becomes a pretty easy decision um, in terms of, oh, hey, this is the one that has, the, you know, clearly the most traction. This is the one that the market is agreeing on. So, you know, to some degree, you know, the, 
sort of the spinning up of a competitive product from one of these cloud providers is nothing more than mar market validation. And then the question becomes, if you are sort of the database provider, are you better at developing your database than one of the cloud providers? And the answer probably in most cases is yes. So anyhow, um, there are debates. I go back and forth with this, you know, with, uh, you know, vendors all the time. Um, we have, uh, <laughs> let's call them robust and spirited dialogues uh, in which they uh, will, will sort of explain all the ways I'm wrong and, um, you know, how this is, a, you know, this is the only path for them and so on. Um, I, you know, personally, I just don't see it. You know, I, I think that there are, you know, absolute ways to compete, um, you know, using just your standard license, you know, moving forward. In our next highlight video, we'll look at how open source software has become a key component of the software supply chain for the entire industry. See you then.